I am so happy to be here. I've never been to Portland before. I am already charmed. I was on the phone with my husband trying to convince him to move here on my way over. And thank you so much, Paul. I now can't see where you've gone for inviting me here. Thank you to Literary Arts for hosting. I'm also um, really excited to meet some of the folks from Tin House for the first time in person tonight um, because it's a magazine that I've loved for many years. So it just, it's so apparent that there's such an incredible literary life and culture in this town and I'm glad to be part of it for a night. Um, so I thought what I would do, so that this most recent book, The Empathy Exams, is a collection of essays that are all about empathy from one direction or another, although I didn't set out necessarily to write a whole set of essays about empathy. It turned out that it was a pet obsession that was underneath everything that was uh, coming out of me. And, and once I thought about putting them into a collection, it became really exciting to me to think about the, the echo chamber that they made. Um, but part of how that process happened of starting to have empathy crystallize as this guiding idea was that I spent some time working as a medical actor while I was living in Iowa City. And for those of you who don't know, medical acting means basically you pretend to have different diseases and disorders and medical students are, you grade them on how well they're able to diagnose you as well as how, how well they're able to express uh, empathy for your situation. So that the process of working as a medical actor and then trying to write about that work got me started thinking about, in a much more explicit way, like what is empathy and what is that, you know, we hear that word a lot, but what is it actually made of? What is it uh, constituted by? And uh, it, was, it was trying to answer that question that kind of propelled me through writing the, the title essay and just thinking about bringing these essays together. So I'm gonna read a, a little piece of the title essay and then a, a piece of one of the other essays in my collection. One September, my brother woke up in a hotel room in Sweden and couldn't move half his face. He was diagnosed with something called Bell's palsy. No one really understands why it happens or how to make it better. The doctors gave him a steroid called prednisone that made him sick. He threw up most days around twilight. He sent us a photo. It looked lonely and grainy. His face slumped. His pupil glistened in the flash, bright with the gel he had to put on his eye to keep it from drying out. He couldn't blink. I found myself obsessed with his condition. I tried to imagine what it was like to move through the world with an unfamiliar face. I thought about what it would be like to wake up in the morning in the groggy space where you've managed to forget things to forget your whole life, and then snapping to, realizing, yes, this is how things are, checking the mirror, still there. I tried to imagine how you feel a little crushed each time, coming out of dreams to another day of being awake with a face not quite your own. I spent large portions of each day, pointless, fruitless spans of time, imagining how I would feel if my face was paralyzed, too. I stole my brother's trauma and projected it onto myself like a magic lantern pattern of light. I obsessed and told myself this obsession was empathy. But it wasn't, quite. It was more like <coughs> empathy. I wasn't expatriating myself into another life so much as importing its problems into my own. During the months of my brother's Bell's palsy, whenever I woke up in the morning and checked my face for a fallen cheek, a drooping eye, a collapsed smile, I wasn't ministering to anyone. I wasn't feeling toward my brother so much as I was feeling toward a version of myself, a self that didn't exist but theoretically shared his misfortune. I wonder if my empathy has always been this in every case, just a bout of hypothetical self-pity projected onto someone else. Is this ultimately just solipsism? 
Adam Smith confesses in his theory of moral sentiments, when we see a stroke aimed and just ready to fall upon the leg or arm of another person, we naturally shrink and draw back our own leg or our own arm. We care about ourselves, of course we do. Maybe some good comes from it. If I imagine myself fiercely into my brother's pain, I get some sense, perhaps, of what he might want or need because I think, I would want this, I would need this. But it also seems like a fragile pretext, turning his misfortunes into an opportunity to indulge pet fears of my own devising. Empathy isn't just something that happens to us, a meteor shower of synapses firing across the brain. It's also a choice we make to pay attention, to extend ourselves. It's made of exertion, that dowdier cousin of impulse. Sometimes we care for another because we know we should or because it's asked for, but this doesn't make our caring hollow. The act of choosing simply means we've committed ourselves to a set of behaviors greater than the sum of our individual inclinations. I will listen to his sadness, even when I'm deep in my own. To say, going through the motions, this isn't reduction so much as acknowledgement of effort, the labor, the motions, the dance, of getting inside another person's state of heart or mind. This confession of effort chafes against the notion that empathy should always rise unbidden, that genuine means the same thing as unwilled, that intentionality is the enemy of love. But I believe in intention and I believe in work. I believe in waking up in the middle of the night and packing our bags and leaving our worst selves for our better ones. And the next piece I'm, I'm going to read is from the beginning of the second essay in the collection, which is a piece called Devil's Bait. And I was, you know, when I was uh, talking at Paul's school this morning, I, you know, one of the students asked a question that is, is, is always a difficult question for me to answer, which is some version of uh, which essay in the collection is most meaningful to me, or, you know, which which one of my children would I not kill, or you know, something like that is hard question to answer, but um, I, I do have a special attachment to this piece that I'm gonna read from, partially because, you know, in, it, there are all kinds of nonfiction you can write, and some are easier, some kinds of nonfiction are easier to write without money than others, honestly. It's easier to write memoir without money than journalism, because when you're reporting a piece, if you don't, if you're not on assignment from a magazine, you're fronting a lot of bills, like a lot of travel bills and expense bills, essentially on your own. So it can be tough to start out as a freelance journalist and to write the pieces you're excited by, because it means you're, uh, as I was for this piece, putting a lot of money on your credit cards that you don't necessarily have. So I really felt like I, you know, I pitched this piece around a lot and nobody wanted it, and um, I kind of just went for it anyway. And so I think in that way, I, I feel like we, this story and I believed in each other before anyone else believed in either of us. So uh, it's, it's, it's close to my heart for that reason. And, and it makes me uh, glad to think that it's made its way into the world. Uh, so the piece is called Devil's Fate. For Paul, it started with a fishing trip. For Lenny, it was an addict whose knuckles were covered in sores. Dawn found pimples clustered around her swimming goggles. Kendra noticed ingrown hairs. Patricia was attacked by sand flies on a Gulf Coast beach. The sickness can start as blisters or lesions or itching or simply a terrible fog settling over the mind, over the world. For me, Morgellons disease started as a novelty. People said they had a strange disease and no one, or hardly anyone, believed them. But there were a lot of them, almost 12,000 of them, and their numbers were growing. Their illness manifested in lots of ways, sores, itching, fatigue, pain, and something called formication, the sensation of crawling insects. But its defining symptom was always the same, strange fibers emerging from underneath the skin. In short, people were finding unidentifiable matter coming out of their bodies. 
not just fibers, but fuzz, specks, and crystals. They didn't know what this matter was, or where it came from, or why it was there, but they knew, and this was what mattered, the important word, that it was real. The diagnosis originated with a woman named Mary Lytow. In 2001, she took her toddler son to the doctor because he had sores on his lip that wouldn't go away. He was complaining of bugs under his skin. The first doctor didn't know what to tell her, and neither did the second or the third. Eventually, they started telling her something she didn't want to hear, that she might be suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy because they couldn't find anything wrong with her son. Lytow came up with her own diagnosis. Morgellons was born. Lytow pulled the name from a treatise written by a 17th century doctor named Thomas Brown. I long ago observed in that endemial distemper of little children in Languedoc, called the Morgellons, wherein they critically break out with harsh hairs on their backs, which takes off the unquiet symptoms of the disease and delivers them from coughs and convulsions. Brown's harsh hairs were the early ancestors of today's fibers, the threads that form the core of this disease. Magnified photos online show them in red, white, and blue, like the flag, and also black and clear. These fibers are the kind of thing you describe in relation to other kinds of things, jellyfish or wires, animal fur or taffy candy or a fuzz ball off your grandma's sweater. Some are called golden heads because they have a golden colored bulb. Others look like cobras curling out of the skin, thread thin but ready to strike. Others simply look sinister, technological, tangled. The magnification in these photos makes it hard to know what you're looking at, if you're even seeing skin. Patients started bringing these threads and flecks and fuzz to their doctors, storing them in Tupperware or matchboxes, and dermatologists actually developed a phrase for this, the matchbox sign, a signal that the patient had become so determined to prove his own disease that he could no longer be trusted. So basically I, I started doing some research on Morgellons disease and, and read a report released by the CDC about you know, their determination of whether or not it was real, which ended up being quite um, indeterminate. And eventually I, I knew, I went, I knew that I, I really knew that I wanted to go to this annual conference that Morgellons patients had in Austin, and, uh, and so I did. That was what I put on the critical. <laughs> The West Oak Baptist Church on Slaughter Lane is a few miles south of the Austin, I'd imagine, a city full of Airstream trailers selling gourmet donuts, vintage shops crammed with animal heads and lace, m melancholy guitar riffs floating from ironic cowboy bars. Slaughter Lane isn't vintage lace or cutting edge donuts or ironic anything. It's Walgreens and Denny's and eventually a parking lot sliced by the spindly shadow of a 20-foot cross. The church itself is a low blue building surrounded by temporary trailers. A conference banner reads, searching for the uncommon thread. I've arrived at the conference in the aftermath of the CDC report as the Morgellons community assembles once more to regroup, to respond, to insist. A cluster of friendly women stand by the entrance greeting new arrivals. They wear matching shirts printed with the letters DOP slashed by a diagonal red line. DOP is um, what a lot of doctors had taken to diagnosing Morgellons patients that it stands for delusions of parasitosis. So there was a sort of army of people with anti-DOP t-shirts on. <laughs> Most of the participants at the conference, I will come to realize, give the wholesome, welcoming impression of no-nonsense Midwestern housewives. I learn that 70% of Morgellons patients are female, and that women are especially vulnerable to the isolating disfigurement and condescension that come attached to this disease. The greeters direct me past an elaborate buffet of packaged pastries and into the church sanctuary, which is serving as the main conference room. Speakers stand at the makeshift pulpit, a lectern, with their PowerPoint slides projected onto a screen behind them. The stage is cluttered with musical equipment. Each cloth-covered pew holds a single box of Kleenex. 
There's a special eating area in the back, tables littered with coffee cups, muffin greased plastic, and the skeletons of grape bunches. The room has one stained glass window, a dark blue circle holding the milky cataract of a dove, but the colors admit no light. The window is small enough to make the dove look trapped. It's not flying, but stuck. This gathering is something like an AA meeting or a Quaker service. Between speakers, people occasionally just walk up to the podium and start sharing. Or else they do it in their chairs, hunched over to get a better look at each other's limbs. They swap cell phone photos. I hear a man tell a woman, I live in a bare apartment near work, don't have much else. I hear her reply, but you still work. Here's what else I hear. So you just run the sound waves through your feet. You see them coming out as chunks, literally hanging off the skin. You got it from your dad. You gave it to your son. My sons are still young. He has fibers in his hair, but no lesions on his skin. I use a teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon of vitamin C. I was drinking borax for a while, but I couldn't keep it up. HR told me not to talk about it. Your arms look better than last year. You seem better than last year, but you feel better than last year. I hear someone talking about what her skin is expressing. I hear someone say, it's a lonely world. I feel close to the specter of whole years lost. I discovered that the people who can't help whispering during lectures are the ones I want to talk to, that the coffee station is useful because it's a good place to meet people and because drinking coffee means I'll have to keep going to the bathroom, which is an even better place to meet people. The people I meet don't look disfigured at first glance, but up close they reveal all kinds of scars and bumps and scabs. They are covered in records, fossils, or ruins of the open, oozing things that once were. Cause
that I burned the book that I bought you. I still want you more now. You gave him your body for two grays on. Got the glory, now God is gone. I'm sorry that I burned the book that I bought you. I still want you more now. You gave him your body. how it sounds out there, the bass on the piano feels, it's okay, it's not, right. that, that song is called um, Drones, and um, I always think about how the, both ends of the supply chain um, are dancing together with a curtain between them, and so um, the, you know, what we, what we, um, what we experience of, of drones here is, is, a, is a sort of privacy of being that um, has its own violence. Uh, so anyhow, um, this song is called Bring Me Down Young. Um. Father says mother's belly is a barricade and there are many ways to be betrayed. Not tonight Joy is to be in a room together, so um, it's 
good to have that still with us. Um, okay, this song is called Skinny Like Water. Mom kept us 